Hello! Welcome to St. James's Online Worship for Sunday, August 29th, which is the 14th Sunday after Pentecost. I hope this liturgy will re-energize you in those places where you're drained and center you in those places where you're unhelpfully scattered. Our service continues with the opening acclamation. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. songs. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom, they give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. 
Thanks be to God. Please join me in saying Psalm 45. My heart is stirring with a noble song. Let me recite what I have fashioned for the king. My tongue shall be the pen of a skilled writer. You are the fairest of men. Grace flows from your lips because God has blessed you forever. Your throne, O God, endures forever and ever a scepter of righteousness in the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above, all, above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh, aloes, and cassia, and the music of strings from ivory palaces makes you glad. King's daughters, stand among the ladies of the court. On your right hand is the queen, adorned with the gold of Ophir. A reading from the book of James. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his, first, of his create creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive them, who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and per persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Christ. When the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold the human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, 
fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The first reading uh, for this Sunday was from Song of Solomon, uh, otherwise known as Song of Psalms. It's a, a love poem in which the voice alternates between the voice of the woman in this heterosexual couple and the voice of the man. Today, uh, today's text uh, was the voice of the woman. She said, the voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Now, this poem um, becomes more explicitly erotic at other times in its text. So I thought for today, I would join the church's long history of how it is taught about the Song of Solomon. I am being silly, of course, um, but I want to uh, say why I'm doing it is because the church historically has talked very little about the Song of Solomon because we've been uncomfortable with an erotic love poem being in the Bible. And I guess it's not just us. I learned this week that uh, in some Jewish traditions, the Song of Solomon is the one biblical text that boys are not allowed to learn in Hebrew before their bar mitzvah. In our Christian tradition, uh, we've either tried to mute the text by arguing it's an allegory for God's love for God's people, or we've just more often not talked about it. So I thought today I would talk about it a little bit. Um, and so, while I will confess to being a bit of an uptight prude uh, and a wasp, um, I'm going to read for you a few more bits from the Song of Solomon. I'm just going to quote them directly. Um, some of the texts that are more explicitly erotic and sexual. If you don't want to hear this because you're uncomfortable with it, or you don't want someone in your household to hear it, um, just go ahead and hit the mute button for a minute, and uh, or step away. Um, and when I'm done talking, it won't take very long. I'll, I'll kind of wave and welcome you back if you don't want to hear the uh, more explicit uh, love poetry of other parts of this book. So here's the voice of the man about the woman towards the end of the book in chapter 7. How fair and pleasant you are, O loved one, delectable maiden. You are stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its branches. O may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath like apples. And your kisses like the best wine that goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. The woman's voice is maybe a little more subtle, but no less risque, and perhaps more so. As she says in chapter 4, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south wind. Blow upon my garden, that its fragrance may be wafted abroad. Let my beloved come to his garden, and eat its choicest fruits. When she's talking about her garden, that is what you think it is. If you see more of the text, it makes that clear. This is not utterly poetic, um, metaphoric language. It is, uh, stop talking about what you think it might be talking about. For those of you who are gone, come on back, come on back, unmute. I think the voice of the woman in Song of Solomon is the most countercultural, given that both then and now of course, sexual desire in women is so much more frowned upon, more taboo. It's more culturally unacceptable for women to have sexual desire than for a man. Um, and so there's much shame and repression with that. 
But here in the Song of Solomon, the woman has the desire for sexual intimacy, and it is just presented as good and lovely. Not unacceptable, not shameful, not a sign the woman is doing anything wrong or doing anything wrong or desiring anything wrong. It's just good that the woman desires the man in that way. We have this book in our Bible that valorizes sexual desire. It's kind of a wild teaching, right? But it's certainly not one that we've been teaching much about. Um, whether you're male or female or non-binary, um, Christian teaching has always leaned in the direction that desire is a bad thing, one to hide, one to not talk about, one to feel shame or embarrassment about, and one to try to like repress to make it go away and to not act on it. But if we're being biblical, then that's not right. That there may be some brands of desire that aren't acceptable. You know, Jesus talks about some things in today's gospel that are negative, some hurtful desires. Um, but there's also much bodily desire that we should just simply celebrate. And we should find ways to talk about um, and normalize. So there's not unnecessary shame. There's not unnecessary um, self-loathing and self-repression. So a few things uh, that I just want to move on to. Um, I do think that um, we're coming up on the season in this church where we start to talk about stewardship. And so we'll talk about... Um, you know, stewardship of time and stewardship of talent and, of course, money. Um, why we want things. And um, I think maybe stewardship of desire should also be on that list. To examine what we want in our bodies, in our hearts, in our souls, and why we want it. And not to feel bad about it. It is what it is often. But pay attention to the ways that um, the things that are our desires and create the space for them to either be followed or to evolve. Now, there are some bits of our desire that are perfect just the way they are. I think about homosexual and bisexual folks in our community, you know, and, and homosexual and bisexual folks that are told that they need to change who they love. Um, and even that Christian tradition of sort of ex-gay therapy, reparative therapy, trying to make gay folks straight, that's wrong. Um, who you love doesn't change despite that. Um, and God doesn't want that to change, nor should you. But there are parts of our bodily desires that can be tweaked. Um, you know, uh, to use a less controversial sort of topic, but one that I think more than just I wrestle with, um, I'm an anxiety eater. When I'm stressed, I want to overeat. When I'm bored, I want to overeat. When I'm feeling sorry for myself, I want to overeat. You know that. Um, uh, and I remember with some clarity, uh, all too frequently, when my primary care physician told me a few years ago that he wanted me to cut the Diet Coke out of my diet because even though it had no calories, the sweetness of it would increase my sweet tooth. And if I would eliminate the Diet Coke, um, if I would eliminate some of that false sweetness, I would have less of a sweet tooth for uh, desserts and such. Haven't entirely followed that advice yet, I will confess. Um, but that's an example of a, a desire that can be shaped and stewarded. But it's not always about minimizing desire. In fact, quite often, I think it's actually about increasing our desire. I think that's often what God is trying to stoke in us to more desire for others in our bodies and our hearts um because we're not only better for ourselves with more desire and we're not only better for romantic partners with more desire but we're, we're better for others and for the world and for god part of christian love is desire for god part of christian love is desire for the betterment of the world we're supposed to stoke our fires of love, which are wrapped up with desire. Those things are not separate things as Christian love and desire, and those things are separate categories. They're wrapped up in each other, just in the same way that body and heart are wrapped up in each other. God loves our desires in ways that we're uncomfortable with our desires because God loves the fullness of who we are. 
And so even those parts of our desire that we're not so sure should be discussed in polite company, God smiles on that. And God's desire is that our desire be free of shame. God's desire is that our desire be free of self-doubt. God's desire is that our desire be something that we can revel in, both for the good it brings to ourselves and the good that it enables in the lives of those who cross our paths. Amen. Now I invite you to join me in proclaiming the faith of the church in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Alan and Gail, our bishops, for the community of St. James's, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask for your prayers and thanksgivings, aloud or in silence, you wish at this time. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Loving God, ever faithful to your people, hear the prayers we offer you this day 
and give us your heart and strength that we may declare your praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth it is as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday announcements for August 29th, 2021. Since the splash pad gathering at Danahy Park was rained out last week by Tropical Storm Henri, we're rescheduling it for today. Come over from 11 to 1 and bring your lunch if you'd like. You're welcome to join us if you're a little one who wants to go on the water or one of us older saints who wants to regroup with our friends at St. James and chat a while. Item two, Reverend Matt, Jeff Zingsmeyer, and others are joining the Porter Square Neighborhood Association this coming Thursday for their yearly neighborhood cleanup. Together with students from Leslie College, we'll be beautifying our church neighborhood. This will take place on Thursday, September 2nd, from 9.30 a.m. till noon. Item three, September 12th is Homecoming Sunday. While we're hoping the new building will be ready, our plan will be to worship outside in the new garden. You should know, however, that there will be indoor seating available in the new parish hall. The service will be recorded and available via the YouTube premiere website for those who wish to stay home or can't attend the service. Remember, pencil in the date, September 12th, into your calendars, and of course, cross your fingers for good weather. Item four, if all goes according to plan, we'll also have a grand reopening on September 18th from 2 to 4 p.m. There will be fun, at, fun and activities out in the garden, tours of the new building, music, and more. This is also your chance to invite a friend who's curious about the new place, but might, might not want to go to a worship service. This concludes the uh, announcements. Thank you and may God bless you. Hello, um, today you get a, a second set of announcements because um, things have evolved since Michael recorded his announcements and the uh, poor Mike has had to uh, uh, re-record uh, months multiple times in, in August and I didn't want to make him have to do that yet again. So today you get uh, announcements round two with Matt. Um, uh, we have learned that the closing on our building um, when the lawyers come together and sign documents is likely to happen uh, right after Labor Day. Um, so it's good that we are uh, honing in on a date, um, but it does mean that we think we can't do September 12th for in-person worship um, as we had been hoping for. Um, so here's the sort of tentative plan at this point that I wanted to put on your radar. Um, and we are looking at the following. Um, on September 12th, because we can't go to the church, um, we are, with thanks to Curtis Fisher, uh, going to Fresh Pond Reservation. There's a park there um, that will let us worship on, on that Sunday morning. And so stay tuned for information about that in, in our MailChimp, uh, e Sunday News e-newsletter, and also you'll hear about it in announcements next week. Um, and uh, then we're, we're going to try, still try to do our grand opening on Saturday, September 18th, but then do our homecoming in the new church building, God willing, um, on September 19th. So um, just wanted to put that on your radar. That's where we're at with our timeline for our new building. Um, and hopefully this plan will come together. Bye-bye. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, 
Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the blessing of the one God, Creator, Christ and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth loved, known, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.
Thank you.